Hello, and welcome back to the Circling Shell Sports Podcast. I am back with another Seattle interview series. Uh, we're in a different spot. This is a lot different than the normal Zoom meetings you're accustomed to, and uh, very grateful to Big O and Converge. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later at a different point. But I'm here with Olivia Sicani, uh, UW goalkeeper. I mean, I'm just going to go down the list of achievements oh, here. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I always have to. Uh, so former member of the US U18 national team, 2018 Pac-12 All-Academic second team, 2019 Pac-12 Academic Honor Roll, Pac-12 Keeper of the Week back, uh, back in March of last year. Uh, wait, no, that was this year. This year, yeah. Yeah, this year. Ooh, uh, last last year throws me off. Yeah. Uh, lowest single season GAA in program history at UW and had a 646 minute shutout streak last season. Um, this is the 98th minute of the podcast here and the 31st Seattle Interview Series uh, installment. How have you been? I know that we had a couple uh, not so savory results down in North Carolina there, but um, I mean, how has it been since last season? Obviously, coming off the tournament and just getting that off-season underway, first off-season at UW, technically, I guess. How have things been for you going uh, so far this year? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been great to be back in Seattle. Um, everything's been pretty good. Uh, it was obviously a little bit of a different year because we had a season in the spring, which is not something that we're accustomed to. So it was a definitely a quick turnaround, but um, as much as it was tough to get right back into the swing of things. It was also super fun because we didn't have to sit and, you know, sulk on losing. And, you know, even though we had a great run in the tournament, obviously we always want more. We're not satisfied unless we win the natty. But, um, yeah, so just <laughs> to be able to turn around and get right back at it has been, has been great. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, I've been good and the, team, the team's looking good. You know, obviously the results in North Carolina weren't what we wanted. But we learned a ton about ourselves and the way that we are capable of playing. And we really got better from the first game to the second game. And I think it's still just going to continue to grow and we're going to get better every single game. Um, so yeah, so overall, things have been pretty good. So with that being said, I want to you know, take us away from you, Dub, and go back to sort of the beginning of things, right? Okay. Are you able to pinpoint? where the passion for the game of soccer took off, where that, you know, part of your journey started? Oh, um, that's tough. I mean, from the minute I started playing, I started playing when I was seven, which is actually a little bit late for soccer. Most of my teammates are like at four or five, but I was seven years old and I told my parents I wanted to go out for soccer. And so they signed me up. My dad was my first assistant coach and like, you know, did the little rec league and, um, but yeah, I just, I always knew that I loved it. And um, like, just from, just from the jump, I really, I really enjoyed it. And then um, I put, I got put in goal pretty much right away because I was tall and not super fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they were like, yeah, you can go, you can go back there. And I was like, sick, no running, I'll do this. Um, but no. Stay in one place. Exactly, right. And like, I just, I, that's what I really, gravitated towards too as much as like soccer as a whole is amazing and I love it more than anything like goalkeeping in particular like once I started there I was hooked so yeah probably about seven years old are there any keepers you know from whether it's from a young age to even now that you sort of looked up to maybe model yourself after obviously you know if you look at UW there's Hope Solo um some things there that were not that's a different time. Uh, you know, up in even Seattle, you know, if you go over to the men's side, you know, Stephen Fry, Steph Cleveland stepped in well. You know, with that being said, you know, along your journey, have there been any goalkeepers that you've sort of modeled yourself after or looked, uh, looked up to? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Hope Solo was like in her prime when I was growing up and like I was watching, um, I was watching like the 2011 Women's World Cup and like just like losing my mind over how amazing she was and like um yeah so definitely definitely hope solo i still may or may not have a poster up in my room at home but um hope solo for sure um and one of like my first goalkeeper coach ever um put me on to peter schmeichel uh the former man united and danish goalkeeper and he sent me he would send me home from training and say okay go like look him up on youtube and watch and because that was he's a big he was a big man united guy and so i just was like so into the way that he just was kind of <laughs> kind of 
crazy and he would like do all these insane things and like he he was just so intense and so passionate at all times and like that translated like that was his presence but also that translated into how he played and that was definitely something that I tried to emulate and I still definitely do try to emulate is just that that like fire and intensity um on the pitch so those would probably be my top two is Peter Schmeichel and Hope Solo <laughs> Not a, not a bad thing to emulate as long as it's controlled, I guess. Exactly. You know? It's controlled chaos. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned your father a little bit ago. Uh, did you play any other sports growing up? Because obviously your dad's got the baseball background. Yes. Uh, Jason Sakani played baseball at UVA uh, and with the Red Sox organization from 96 to 2001. Coaches with Granada High School Baseball, if I'm correct, that could be different now. No, that's still, he still, still does that, yeah. Um, was softball ever in the cards or baseball or was it, you know, as soon as you picked up the soccer ball, there was no going back and just didn't, had tunnel vision per se. Yeah, um, I played t-ball, I played baseball when I was really little. Um, and I did enjoy that. I definitely was one of those things where it's like, I wanted to be like my dad and bond with my dad because he was the big athlete and I was into that. And I was also a huge tomboy when I was a kid. And so all of my like closest friends in like kindergarten, first grade were boys. And so I was like, well, I just want to play with them. Like, I'll just go play on their team. So it wasn't, I never really went the softball route, but definitely baseball when I was like, when I was little. And then, um, no, I definitely, I definitely tried some other stuff too. Um, I played tennis for a little bit. I played volleyball through middle school. Um, but soccer, soccer was just the one, like I, I knew that that was always just going to be my number one. Um, yeah, so I tried, I dabbled. I dabbled in a couple of things, but it was always soccer. Um, and then kind of jumping ahead from, you know, that smaller age, how was your experience with the, you know, the US U18 team? I mean, I'm sure that might have been perhaps a lot of bit of uh, pressure or just a sort of experience for you to go out and prove yourself and just see what you can do on that stage. How was that experience for you overall? Yeah, um, that was incredible. Um, Playing with the national team was something that from being a kid and watching Hope Solo and then like getting older and starting the OD Olympic development program process and getting into competitive soccer, that was something that I always had my eye on. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't really a super highly touted recruit or anything like that. I was a very late bloomer physically. So like the, the stature I have now was not always the case. Um, but, um, so like it, it definitely, it took me a little bit longer to break onto that scene than like some of my peers. And when I finally did get that opportunity, I was so overjoyed. Like I had, I had never cried tears of joy until the day that I got that, I got that invitation. And so it was, it was an amazing experience. And, um, there definitely was, it definitely was a lot of pressure. Um, I think that I'm a person that like, I, I, there's no shortage of pressure that I put on myself. Um, and I think that especially as a kid and as a teenager, um, having such high aspirations, which not that I don't now, but I got very tunnel vision and focused on outcomes and I forgot a lot of time to enjoy the journey and enjoy the opportunities that I was getting. Um, so I was so results focused that I just couldn't, I, I kind of froze myself up. And so it was definitely like, I don't feel like my perf like performance wise, it was necessarily my best times, but just the opportunity. I mean, anytime you can represent your country, that's such a great honor and amazing opportunity. So um, I'm so, so grateful for that. And hopefully I'll get to do it again in the future. So. Well, even to go back to what we talked about with Hope Soul, I'm sure that was a moment where you might've looked up at that poster and be like, you know, this is, kind of similar here you know i'm representing the u.s obviously yeah. not on a different stage yeah but you know still must have been a cool part to say hey you know that's kind of a similarity there um not entirely but i mean i, I think you get what i'm saying with that oh definitely um, yeah so that must have been really cool uh to do that and for you and like you're saying just tears of joy i can only imagine what that's like and obviously hoping to get back to that stage definitely um, just at a different uh perspective yes um so you know, moving away from that, how did, you know, committing to Cal come into play? Where did, you know, was it 
a visit? Was it just you know a local thing from you know being in California? What played into attending Cal Berkeley? Yeah, um, I definitely, I definitely was sold by my visit there. Um, the campus is beautiful. It's a really cool. Berkeley's a really cool place to be. Um, still have a lot of love for Berkeley, um, but uh, yeah, and I think. I, I wanted to stay for sure on the West Coast, and I'm definitely a homebody, so being, um, I grew up about 45 minutes away from Cal campus, and so that was that was nice to have my family there, and they could come to the games and all the time, and um, yeah, so it just seemed like, it seemed like a pretty natural, natural fit, and um, obviously the academics and the soccer were both high level. I mean, you're getting Pac-12 soccer, and then like one of the best institutions in the world, and so, can really complain with either of those things. So, yeah, it was, it was just kind of a good, it seemed like a good fit at the time, so. So in your freshman year, you redshirt. Yes. And then, so and in the redshirt freshman season, which always, how that always works, confuses me a little bit, but I yes. get it mostly. Um, yeah. So in the first season you, know, you played, uh, Pac-12, all academic second team started 11 games started 10 games, appeared in 11 games, apologies. Yeah. No, you're fine. So how do you approach that year after redshirting in the first one? Is it just the first year that you redshirt? Is it just, you know, I'm just gonna train so that I'm ready for when the opportunity arises? What was the mindset going into that year um, of 2018? Yeah, I mean, freshman year, I definitely was just focused on contributing to the program however I could. Um, I was sitting behind a an all-american goalkeeper who plays professionally now and emily boyd who's still like an awesome human being and mentor to me and like um love e boyd so um but yeah i definitely was just focused on like competing and getting better and pushing her but then also and just growing so that like you said i would be ready for the time that i was meant to step in um and then yeah going into that year i definitely felt like you know i had prepared and i was I was ready to step in and you know I still I had a lot to learn and goalkeeping is a lot about experience so you can't really replicate anything like a Pac-12 game in training <laughs> um, but I was I mean I was nervous but I was very very excited and I was very excited to represent Cal um, and yeah get the opportunity to play at such an awesome level so. So we take 2018, right? And I'm sure that's a pretty good feeling, you know, start those 10 games, you know, appear in 11, uh, get, sort of get that first year, you know, in a way, under your belt. Mm -hmm. And then 2019 comes around, you see action in two games. Uh, you know, what are you thinking throughout the year? Is it sort of a tough thing or is it sort of, hey, this is the card that I've been played and now I just have to roll with it. And like you said, in 2017, just contribute what I can to the program. How, was, how do you look back on 2019? Yeah, I mean, as much as, yeah, like I got, I got some good minutes in 2018. The 2018 season was in no way, um, in no way a cakewalk, in no way a, <laughs> a very fun experience uh, for a lot of reasons on and off the field. Um, and so I kind of knew, I, I in no way was resigned to the fact that I wasn't really going to see much action in 2019. I, you know, trained like crazy all summer like I usually do and um, I actually spent time that summer it was my first time heading back to the Keeper Institute on the East Coast um, and that was one of the best things I could have ever done for my career I go back there all the time but um, yeah I definitely my mindset was shifted for sure because I realized at that point that Cal was just not going to provide me the opportunity that I needed in order to progress and get better and take my game to the next level, which is ultimately my goal. Um, and so I, as much as then I continued, I was like, all right, well, I'm still going to be a good teammate. I'm still going to do what I do, what the program needs me to do. Um, it was definitely a different, a different mentality because I was planning on, you know, graduating early, getting out and heading somewhere else so that I could really pursue those dreams again. And um, yeah, so it was, it was a it was a different year and it was a it was a weird role for me to be in because I'm such a natural competitor and just like I'm just, yeah I'm I'm very very competitive and so uh, I'm kind of resigning to that to that fact because it was made pretty clear to me that the job was just there was nothing that I could do to get the job back um, was uh, was very very tough for me but um, 
yeah, but I still, my focus then was just, yeah, being a good teammate, trying to do what I had to do, and then moving forward, so. So, you know, take that, obviously, I'm sure not the easiest of years in 2019. Yeah. What made you dub the place that you wanted to come next? Because obviously in the Pac-12, you know, you get a little bit of a taste of that. Not, yeah. Not very much, but. Yeah. How did, you know, the University of Washington come to play and ultimately make it the place that you wanted to continue that collegiate career? Yeah, um, so I actually, <laughs> my transfer story was a little bit interesting because it got um, interrupted by COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. So I went into the transfer portal um, in December of 2019. And typically with like higher level division one, like power five schools and players, it, you're in there for a month or two at most, you know, um, go on visits, figure it out. And I was doing all that. And then um, I was about ready to commit to a couple of different places. I was going on, I went on visits to West Virginia and Pitt, and those were two of my top choices. And then one of those offers fell through and the other one I just didn't really feel great about. And so I ended up turning it down and I was kind of back to square one. And then the next week everything shut down for COVID. And um, <laughs> so then I was kind of left high and dry and I had nothing really on the table. And I was a little bit freaked out thinking like, am I just not gonna have a team? Am I just gonna take a gap year? Um, you know, I graduated, am I gonna just try to go abroad and play? Like, what am I gonna do? And then um, once the recruiting uh, started back up again, um, UW, my goalkeeper coach that I work with in the Bay Area reached out to uh, UW because he had a friend on the staff and said, hey, are you guys looking for a goalkeeper? And it turned out they were. Um, so I got in touch with the staff here and ultimately, ultimately with Nicole Van Dyke, our head coach, who really was like the, the thing that like tipped, tipped the scales for me. She's incredible. And she and I are very like-minded in a lot of ways. We're very, we're both pretty intense people, um, to, to put it, to put it nicely. We're both very intense people. We're both, uh, uber competitive um and driven and i really really appreciated having such a strong woman at the helm of the program um and also to i mean i had been to seattle before and played up here and seattle is just such a cool place to be and um to still be in the pac-12 and still be in a power five conference and playing against some of the best opponents in the country um like it all it all just kind of added up um, and seemed to fit really well. So I ended up committing verbally in like the end of May of 2020. And then uh, coming up to report for what at the time we thought was gonna be a fall season of 2020 <laughs> in August. Um, but yeah, uh, so it just kind of, it kind of popped up out of the blue and it was a weird, not at all how I thought that process was gonna go, but that's kind of the story of my, my life and my career is things just kind of happen, not the way that I anticipate that they're gonna happen, but they always seem to work out. So um, yeah, so that's kind of that's how I ended up where I'm at. So you, you, know, you come up and report. How did you feel initially you know, coming into UW and that locker room with you know, all these girls you most likely didn't know, right? Um, how was, how was that reception to you and how did you feel initially when you first you know, got with that group of girls? I was welcomed in with open arms immediately. And that was one of the, the selling points that Nicole had really hammered was like the team culture and the girls on the team are so incredible. Um, and yeah, they were so, so welcoming. I clicked with everyone pretty much from the jump, from the get go. Um, and it was a little bit odd, so we, we got up here, and in August, we only actually spent a week up here because they ended up canceling our season and moving it back to the spring. But um, I got to spend some time with uh, some of the underclassmen because I didn't have a place, like I didn't have an apartment up in Seattle yet, so I was put up in the dorms with them. Um, so I got to spend some time with the freshmen at the time, now sophomores, <laughs> as a 22-year-old grad student. So that was a that was an interesting time, or 21 at the time. But um, yeah, so it was. But we got to live together for that whole week, and that was really my first solid exposure to the girls on the team. And then, um, yeah, from there, from then on, like 
we spent some time after we all got sent home because the season got canceled. Um, we spent some time on Zoom and, you know, doing all that stuff. And um, then when we finally regrouped, yeah, it just it, it was very seamless. And I felt I feel more included and more a part of this team than probably any other team that I've ever been on. And like the the culture is just so, so cool to be a part of. And um, I think that that's really what's going to take us to the next level because, you know, we're we all have such a good foundational relationship with each other that then we can we can push each other that much harder because we know it's not coming from a bad place it's not coming from a place of malice it's coming from a place of belief and having having each other's backs you know like i got you i know what you're capable of and i'm going to push you to get there so that we can all get there so and sh <laughs> that's a very long-winded answer to your question of yes i fit in great with the team i love my teammates very much <laughs> well i mean it's good to hear that because you know in any good team you know chemistry is such a big thing you know you can't put all these great players together and just like, expect them to gel like that yeah that doesn't happen I mean, yeah well really it does um so you know and especially to take it into the next thing that that chemistry would be huge playing in the pac-12 because as you've kind of touched on a little bit it's it's a great conference for many reasons but also you know Specifically in your sport, you know, women's soccer. And I mean, last year, what, Stanford, Cal, UCLA were all ranked. Um, so, I mean, is that something that you enjoy playing in the Pac 12 where you can, you know, push yourself and, you know, you know that you're going to have challenges just about every game playing in such a talented conference? Is that something that's part of the, you know, part of the enjoyment of playing in the Pac 12? Absolutely, it is. And like um, a big quote that we've, we've been using on our team this past couple of weeks, having gone out to play such highly ranked opponents in our first couple of games is iron sharpens iron. And you know, if you're gonna be against the best, you gotta push yourself and play against the best every single day. And I think that that's really the opportunity that we're afforded being in the Pac-12. I mean, yeah, like you said, you got Stanford, UCLA, USC, every, every single team from top to bottom in the Pac-12 is outstanding. And like this year was a little bit wonky with the tournament and like taking only 48 teams and stuff but like 2019 season uh, nine out of the 12 pack 12 teams were selected for women's soccer for the tournament and like that just speaks to the the level that every single game is being played at and um yeah from top to bottom it's just a it's a such a solid conference and yeah like who doesn't want to go out there and play against like players for their national teams and for the u.s and for other countries and um yeah like I'm a, I'm, I'm a big like push myself test myself kind of a person and there's no better place to do it so you touch on the tournament can you talk about you know last season's tournament how that all went obviously you know first game you beat liberty i believe it was three nothing in the first round then st louis and pks and i want to talk about st louis in a second okay um but and then obviously number you know playing carolina north carolina uh yep. What was that whole thing like, especially, you know, in, you know, playing in a pandemic setting still? Yeah. What was that whole scenario like? And, you know, how are you guys able to get through that? Because I know it can't be the most, obviously, you know, I'm sure you enjoy being in the tournament, but still being in a pandemic setting, I'm sure there are difficulties to that. So can you sort of describe that experience as a whole, you know, being down there? I, what it was on the East Coast? Yes, it was in North Carolina. It, yeah, so I mean, some home field advantage there for NC. Yeah. But you know, regardless, what was that experience like as a whole for you and the team? Um, it was definitely challenging, but um, again, it was it was something that was I'll never forget either. Like it was it was a great experience overall. Um, you know, when we first went in, being in a bubble situation is is not um ideal by any means and like when we first got there the first two weeks that we were there uh everybody was in their own hotel rooms and we didn't really do much outside of you know team meals which were outside if they were together if not they were grab and go and take them back to your own room um or going to the field to train or going to the games like there was there was very little activity or interaction so it was it was definitely tough to be cooped up like that for for an extended period of time but um no i mean we we really made the most of a very difficult situation because um by the end of this spring we were our our herd was thinning a little bit we had some we had some injuries to some to some key players and we had um you know a couple people had to stay behind and um it was it was it was a tough one but we really 
I think bonded through the adversity and just used the adversity to our advantage. And something we talk about a lot on the team is um, we really thrive as the underdogs, whether or not we're the actual like underdogs in the odds. But um, we try to we try to go into every game as if we're the underdogs and not um, in the tournament. We definitely were the underdogs. We had a lot of people had to really step up and play positions that they had never played before. People playing huge numbers of minutes and running miles and miles and miles and um, you know, just really, really leaving it all out there. And, um, so as much as it, as much as it was not like a picture perfect normal tournament in really any way, it was, it was a very memorable experience and something that I think brought the team closer together. And we were only really able to do because we are so close and we have such a good, such a good bond and such a good trust in each other and chemistry. So now to go back to St. Louis, what is going through your head when you have to take that PK? I mean, does, <laughs> does having that goalkeeper experience help you on that end? Or yes. is it more of like, okay, this is sort of weird. I just have to go out and do my best here and try to put the ball in the net. What, what, are, you, what are you thinking when you're sitting there lined up to, to take that PK? Um, well, at that point, I had been nervous about it for, the, for a couple of days prior because I, I was told... I think two days before the game that I was going to be the number five shooter. Oh, geez. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it probably would have been better. That, it probably you know. would have been better for them to just, like, spring it on me. But I was, yeah. But, um, <laughs> no, so that I had been told a couple days before that I was going to be the number five shooter because we'd been taking some in practice, you know. Like, mm. leading up to the tournament, you typically practice penalties a lot because, you know, there has to be a winner and there's more penalty shootouts in the tournament than in normal Pac-12 play. There's none so um but i had taken a couple and they were pretty good and so my coaches were like hey how do you feel about taking a penalty and i was like i don't know like if the team needs me to step up i'll do it like but i didn't ever think in a million years that i was actually going to be put in the lineup and so then they told me a couple days before like okay you're number five and i was like oh lord i'm i'm what <laughs> and they were like yeah you're number five i was like oh okay and then the next day at practice the day before the game they were like okay you'll be number six like if we go into extras so you take the five and then obviously like if you're tied at five then you go one for one sudden death and i was like okay like somehow that seems like less pressure even though it's sudden death. yeah <laughs> but like <laughs> but i was like okay and then i went over we the final whistle blows for second overtime and um i went over and i was talking to my goalkeeper coach about um like saving the penalties because that's typically my job yes um and i you know we're off to the side and going over the scouting report like okay this person goes this way typically this person goes that way whatever da, 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 da. just you know like he's giving me a pep talk just keep your head straight like do what you need to do and then i come back into the huddle for like the cheer like bow down on three and we do it and i turned to one of my teammates i was like hey like am i in the lineup they're like yeah you're number five i was like oh okay <laughs> Um, but going back to right when I was about to take it, um, honestly, I just tried to shut everything out. Like I just shut kind of everything down. Um, I think it was very helpful that I had saved a penalty a couple rounds before. Um, cause then I was like hyped up and feeling myself and feeling good about that. But no, I mean, I, I remember thinking like it could be roaring loud in the stadium right now and I would have no idea. Like I just remember it being silent and I just put my head down and I didn't look up at the goalkeeper one time, just kept my head down, whistle blew, and I couldn't even like fully watch it. I was so nervous. I couldn't even fully watch it go in. I just kind of like saw it ripple the net out of my peripheral vision and I turned and I sprinted faster. According to my coaches, faster than they've ever seen me run <laughs> to my teammates. So, and they did not expect me to run that fast ever again. So, like you said earlier, um, I stay in the goal and I don't exactly. do any running. I just, exactly. This is my home. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was such an interesting experience because obviously anytime you see a goalkeeper <laughs> on any sort of scoring opportunity, it's always like, whoa, yes. you got to kind of pay attention here. But then sort of hearing that, hey, you'll be fifth. Okay, fine. Hey, oh, you'll be sixth. Oh, that's a little bit better. Okay. And you're back to fifth, you know, right? We're about, you know, however many minutes away from doing this. Like, oh, uh -huh. okay. Sounds good. Good, good, good. Um, cool, cool. So to go to back to Coach Van Dyke, you know, you guys are both, I mean, I believe it was both of your first years uh, yeah. that you guys experienced. 
how has your relationship been with her? You know, just because obviously that's your head coach. Yeah. But also, you know, you both sort of had to go through that first year together. Uh, and you mentioned the intensity. Can you sort of talk about your relationship with Coach Van Dyke? Yeah, she's absolutely incredible. Um, I'm so thankful for her and like I've told her this and she's not a she's not a real warm and fuzzy person and she'll laugh at, at me if she hears this but she's she knows it but she you know I tell her I've told her multiple times like she I I'm just so immeasurably grateful for the opportunity that she's given me to be able to play here and um, I think like I just have the utmost respect for her as a person as a coach um, the things that she's already done with the program in just such a short amount of time um, are incredible. And I think, yeah, like both of us being in our first year, like it was it was a cool experience to kind of go into everything new and like with fresh eyes together. And I think that um, we have a really, really awesome level of trust at this point. Like she's she's got my back, I've got hers 100%. And, um, she's really, um, she's really showed me her trust, especially recently by like giving me a lot more responsibility on the team and a lot more leadership, um, leadership roles that she's handing out. Like obviously as a goalkeeper, I'm kind of like that natural leader persona and like on the field, I'm a second coach and all that. But, um, like really, really giving me and trusting me with more responsibility, um, and, that just that just feels really really awesome because it's like all right she she trusts in me she she believes that you know we're on the same page and we want the same thing for the team and um, yeah I just I'm I'm so so grateful for her she's amazing and then this is something that's relatively new to anything on the college level how did your deal with body armor come into play because you know <laughs> nil this is a whole different thing. Different guys and girls are getting different deals. I know there's a guy that plays for Alabama whose name, his first name's Kool-Aid, and he has a deal with Kool-Aid now. Um, As he should. You know, <laughs> so uh, how did body armor come into play? Was that something where you reached out or did they reach out? How did that come to, you know, reality? Yeah, well, so they, they sort of put out feelers on social media for student athlete ambassadors, like some companies have been doing mm -hmm. um, since the start of the NIL era. and they um you know they requested like hey if you're interested like reach out to us da, 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 like send us some pictures and uh, so i did and um yeah and they they reached back out and said hey you're a student athlete ambassador for body armor now <laughs> um so yeah so it's still it's still pretty new um i'm not entirely sure you know what the future with that holds but i do it was a cool it was a cool one because i do like i have always really liked body armor and like that's not just an ad but like <laughs> I, I have always yeah sponsors sponsored ad um but no i have always um really been a fan of their products and so to be able to partner with them and like that be my first like big partnership has been really cool um so yeah so i'm hoping to do more stuff with them and other brands and stuff in the future but yeah that's kind of it was kind of an impromptu impromptu thing but i'm glad it happened so so to, to leave UW um, and sort of wrap that up, you've already mentioned, you know, taking things to the next level, obviously that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And there are different avenues that you can do that with, whether it's overseas or, you know, obviously here in the U.S., NWSL is the big thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, do you have a preference? Obviously, ultimately, I think it comes down to what the cards give you sometimes. But, Definitely. I mean, if you had choices, I mean, is there any preference? Or is it just, you know, wherever I can go and, you know, represent this, on a professional level is where I'll do it. Ooh, um, I want to go wherever the opportunity is for me to play at the most elite level and develop myself as a player the most. Um, yeah, that's where I'm gonna go. So, I mean, I think that the NWSL has some great opportunities, but at the same time, like it's so, it's so jam packed with so many international players and so many super ultra talented veterans that like breaking into it can be a little bit difficult um and so i think that if i had to guess i'll probably end up going overseas just to start with and also too that's like why would i not want to go live in europe and get paid to play soccer and explore the world and play hopefully for a big club like you know like a psg or a, a leon or um like a Bundesliga team, I don't know, just wherever over there, anywhere, 
anywhere would be awesome. But um, I could see myself definitely starting starting my journey over there and then coming back in the later years of my career to the NWSL, you know, be a little bit closer to home, potentially, you know, starting a family, doing all that, settling down a little bit. But I'm definitely not ready for that. <laughs> ready for that yet. I got a lot of exploring to do and a lot, a lot more stuff to see before I settle down. So, yeah. So I'm, I don't know. You're, you're totally right. Like wherever the cards may fall. <laughs> Um, and even with that being said, in a couple of interviews I've done with Rain players, you know, yeah. they've said that, you know, with veterans like Kristen McNabb or, you know, like Sophia Huerta, they said, you know, usually they recommend almost going overseas first and then going to the NWSL just so you can, you know, obviously see what you want to see, you know, explore exactly. like that, but also, you know, sort of develop and, and even add more to your game as well. And then, I mean, if totally. you want to come over here, because, I mean, there's both great opportunities on you know either you know back home or overseas like you were talking about absolutely you know? yeah. um, so I mean either way I don't think you're going wrong no um, do you have do you I mean I'm pretty sure you have you know you keep in touch with the league a little bit do you have a favorite team there or is it just you sort of just to enjoy the teams the league as a whole because I know that we've got some expansion coming up here we with do. I believe it's LA and San Diego yes so you're getting some California teams there. I know I know but I'm do, very is, excited is there a favorite or is it just sort of enjoying the league as a whole oh um see I have friends on multiple teams and if I say any one of the teams the other ones are gonna get mad at me um no I've definitely I've got some friends that play for Gotham I've got some friends that play for Orlando um where else are people i've got some friends for the that play with the rain like i've got you know i've got some little little tentacles and connections to a bunch of different teams but mostly yeah i just i just really enjoy watching the sport and like seeing how the league is growing and um seeing the success that it's affording so many women and um you know i, th I think that there's still a lot to be done on that front and a lot to be improved but um I do think we're we're heading in the right direction to a certain degree, and um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I have a favorite team. I'm gonna I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one yeah. so I don't bu bug any of my friends. <laughs> but yeah, and that certainly makes sense. You don't want to upset anybody. Uh, um, yeah. You know, with that being said, uh, we're looking at you know 2021 2022 season. Yeah. I mean, technically, so we're in free season. You know. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you know you want to put out there? Usually, I always put out socials are already in there. You know, okay, I always cool. put socials in the description and all that. Um, but is there anything that you want to promote? Obviously, I'm sure you got to get the body armor spot in there. But uh, is there anything yeah. that you want to put out there? Whether it's you know, obviously, you know, watching the games and being the games if you can, you know, because uh, I'm sure there's some people who might yeah. not be able to necessarily go to these games. For sure. Um, but is there anything that you know Olivia wants to put out there into the world? Oh. Um that's a toughie um yeah drink body armor um <laughs> no um yeah just just follow us um support women's soccer wherever you can um you know even at the at the youth level and at the at the club level where whatever you can do but um yeah come support UW women's soccer we got a game this Sunday uh, against LMU so it should be should be a good one and then if you can't attend a lot of our games are either live streamed or on Pac-12 network so uh, check us out. Yeah. And I believe if you go to the uh, you know Utah Athletics website and you go under the women's soccer tab, they usually have just a link. Yeah. To the stream, which is good. You know. The, yes. Sometimes the quality of the video is not always the best, which no. you know I guess is on Utah. But you yeah. Know, overall, it's so good to have that access. So. Definitely. I want to appreciate having you on. Yeah. And I mean, this is still very cool to be doing in person because awesome. normally yeah. I'm sitting behind my computer, with my you know. Uh, uh, shoot camera on you know uh, <laughs> yeah. so this is really great and I appreciate you coming out and very excited to you know get back into you know attending these games yeah. and so if you're a UW student as far as I'm under the impression of and unless we're wrong all it takes is your student ID yep so uh, with that being said I want to thank you for coming on yeah. and uh, best wishes this season awesome. I mean yeah. I know we've got some you know like we said in Pac-12 some big opponents down the line and obviously hoping to win a natty so Heck yeah. thank you again for uh, coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. So sweet. <laughs>